uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, hi, I'm Tim. Um, and yeah, so um, we've heard from other kind of users of open source GIS uh, from sort of local government and um, uh, private enterprise and community groups. Um, so this is a perspective on a, a private commercial company um, using open source GIS um, and how we have, uh, I guess, expanded our GIS team and the system to uh, accompany growth and um, fulfill our, our goals. So um, a little bit about New Zealand carbon farming. Uh, so obviously we are trying to solve a problem and the GIS system needs to reflect that. So um, we're a New Zealand owned company. Uh, we plant lots of trees and we manage lots of trees, but we're not a forestry company as such. We don't cut down those trees. Um, we are developing a, essentially a conservation estate to uh, help mitigate climate change. So realizing that planting trees, sequestering carbon isn't the solution to, uh, to climate change, um, but it does allow us to buy time while we figure out the, the other solutions uh, and changing our en energy sources. So um, some stats there, um, 65,000 hectares uh, of land that we own um, in our conservation estate, including 10,000 hectares of uh, native bush. 65,000 hectares for context is about the size of uh, Lake Topol. Um, additionally, we've got another 45,000 hectares of uh, partner forests, so leased land that we uh, plant and, and manage for people. Uh, we plant most of our trees, or we aim to plant uh, all of our trees on marginal land. So uh, this is the sort of the back hill country falling down into the sea, uh, probably sheep and beef or um, abandoned land. Uh, so we don't plant good land, we, we sell that back to any landowner um, that uh, wants it. So in aggregate, uh, that sort of absorbs one tonne of carbon every 13 seconds. Um, and we are we're planting more, so we need a geosystem to support that. Um, how we do that and why we don't plant natives um, straight into the ground. Um, so by planting pine trees as a cover crop, a nurse crop, uh, allows us to deliver five to ten times more carbon sequestration, and we register that land or those trees in the ETS, which generates carbon credits, which uh, gives us the funding to uh, manage that estate. So do all the other things that we do, which is important to uh, create this biodiverse uh, estate. So pest management, uh, we run the biggest uh, private pest management or pest control uh, program in the country, um, and pest plant and forest health monitoring as well. So that's the, the general process plant lots of trees, really highly uh, stocked, high density um, pine trees uh, to shut out, shut out all the weeds. Then uh, as they get older, we go through and selectively thin those to let uh, light in uh, and then manage the introduction of native species uh, as, that, as that next uh, growth coming through. Pine trees are a pioneer species, so once they grow up and fall over and die, they, they won't grow um, back again. So we've got a very long time frame for that. So uh, enterprising, what do I mean by that? What do we mean? Uh, not that, but a geographic information system that is integrated through the whole, uh, whole organization and system. Essentially, uh, the GIS team getting out of the way as much as possible, um, letting users, uh, people in the field, contribute their knowledge uh, and their uh, expertise into the system uh, without this barrier uh, of the GIS team, I guess. So um, thinking about that and, and what our GIS needs are, again, we're, we're not a forestry company as such. There are off-the-shelf uh, solutions for production forestry, and I've used them in uh, previous jobs. They are good, but they're different enough, or our organisational goal is different enough that that off-the-shelf solution wouldn't work. So we needed a bespoke solution. Um, we also need high amounts of flexibility in that system. We work within a uh, fairly constrained legislative environment in terms of the ETS, which can change, and so we need the ability to adapt that system quickly. We need scalability. 
So you'll see on the next slide that uh, the company has grown, both in terms of staff numbers, but also the land under management. So we need something that we can set up to really um, expand through time. Everybody in the organisation really needs to be able to discover where our information is, get the information they need. Um, and also, you know, our, our time is limited. We don't want to be uh, making maps for people particularly. We want to be focusing our attention on the, the value add. So our timeline is 75 years. So again, we need a system that can that can handle that and uh, obviously we don't know what technology we'll be using in 75 years, but we want to be able to at least design a system where we can go back in time and, and understand uh, the decisions made at that time. Our workforce is a mix, so we have uh, our, our core sort of office-based team here in Parnell, um, but we have most of the team out in the, out in the regions, out in the forests, working there. Um, obviously, in the back blocks of New Zealand, uh, connectivity, cell phone connectivity is pretty poor, so we need solutions that um, enable them to work in that situation. So, um, I joined New Zealand Carbon Farming uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, going back seven or so years ago, um, there were less than five staff, like a few key people. All the GIS type information was uh, done by external contractors, whereas now we're up to uh, 65 people. So there's been a massive growth in uh, people. There's been a rapid growth in the land under management and all the information that goes alongside with that. Um, but the GIS team were the, the kind of gatekeepers of that information. People had to come to us, request something, we'd make a map, that would take time, it would go into a folder, next time around you never knew if that data was now out of date and old, uh, so the products were static. Um, we were using a sort of folder based and shapefile GIS system uh, and external data was downloaded, so we weren't really using uh, web services as much as we should. Um, because data was in folders and shapefiles, it wasn't particularly standardised. So it made it really hard to do aggregation, do uh, sort of gap analysis, um, or build tools on top of it. So the process was good, it was working, um, you know, we'd, we'd been successful um, up, and up to that point, but it was really hard to scale. So our solution, we like to turn it a term it, uh, a new improved revolutionary lemonade ice block. That is to say, nothing particularly revolutionary about it. QGIS, PostGIS um, for the database solution, LizMap for our web mapping uh, solution, I'll talk a little bit about why we use that particularly, uh, and QField, QField Cloud for our field data collection solution. So, um, again, going, going back a few years and um, certainly my experience with using ESRI software for the last 20 years, um, the question was posed, should we continue using QJS um, at New Zealand Carbon Farming or is now the time that we change across to ESRI? Um, and I had a thought about, a think about it and, and did, some, uh, did some work to better understand QJS and, and the um, FOS4G kind of stack. Um, and the answer was, there's, there's no reason not to. Um, we're not a particularly resource constrained company, price wasn't an issue. Uh, so we could have gone with, say, Esri or another solution, but uh, we just felt, hey, like, the open source solution is, is good here, it's gonna do what we need, and uh, of all the benefits that have been talked about in the previous couple of talks. So, uh, first thing was, uh, I kind of went, went through and mapped out as best I could uh, the object relationship diagram how we store data in our system and, and what it needs to capture and collect. Um, of course, I was new to the company, so this was a kind of a, a dual process where I was learning uh, the process and how data was stored, but also thinking about how it could be and, and how we were gonna design this uh, database system. So um, this is still a work in progress. Um, it's changing all the time, and so it's kind of out of date now, but. So implementation, so within uh, six-ish months, maybe eight months of me starting there, um, we had 
implemented a solution. So um, host just, now you can't quite see on that screen, but we went with a hosted uh, solution initially. So there's a United States based company called AccuGIS that sells a, uh, a sort of full stack open GIS um, solution. So using PostGIS as the database um, hosted on the cloud. Once we had that set up, uh, the GIS team could really start to load in that data that was stored in the disparate folders, um, get that schema kind of in place and settled and start building tools and processes against that. Once we had that, then we could uh, implement our web mapping um, solution, so allowing other people in the organization to uh, self-serve their own maps, get um, statistics and, and graphs and information about the, the land that they were using. Um, Lizmap specifically, as opposed to um, another solution, because the Qfield cloud part is, uh, I guess, still rolling out now, um, we, we still needed the ability for people to generate their own geo PDFs. So not just a, a PDF map, but actually a geo PDF that they could use in Avenza. So take out to the field, have a, have a map essentially, and a GPS use there as well. Um, and then sort of third cab off the rank there is Qfield and Qfield Cloud, which we are rolling out now. Uh, there's been a few challenges there, um, and so we're looking to fund um, one, of the, one of the big showstoppers for us uh, to get that over the line and, and, and fix it. So, closing that loop, having people, uh, the GIS team, using and uh, inputting GIS information, having field staff, being able to access that with no uh, connection and having uh, field staff and office staff being able to get the latest information from a web map viewer as well. So uh, some examples about how we use those, those technologies to uh, solve our problems. So um, if you think back uh, near the beginning, we have this, this process of transitioning our pine to uh, native bush. How we do that is by thinning out the trees, leaving light in. Um, we plant at very high stocking, but by the time we uh, get to thinning, uh, actually the stocking is variable. We use uh, poison thinning, so people going in and drilling trees and putting poison in them to kill them. And uh, that obviously that is manual labor and is expensive. So we don't want to uh, thin areas that are already at the required stocking. So we use machine learning uh, in a program called, or a web service called Pictera, uh, and very high resolution aerial photography to count individual trees, generate the stocking um, into bins, and then use that to target our thinning program. Um, call it variable density thinning. So I don't know if you can see there, but there's little squiggly tracks. Those are the GPS tracks of the contractors that are walking through, drilling uh, and poisoning those trees to kill them. Then uh, LizMap was used to provide a, a sort of a dashboard or a management tool for the team that was in charge of that. So being able to draw the daily areas um, and get statistics via um, post-just views and um, yeah, manage hazards and report information as well. So we've got a potentially a, a very dry, hot summer coming up this year. Um, we work closely with uh, Foreign Emergency New Zealand to uh, provide them with data. So a month and a half ago, uh, someone within the company came and said, hey, we need to update all our fire plans. And uh, I, previously, we'd done them manually. Um, but that was going to be a very big ask. Um, especially in the time frames required. So uh, say 90, 93 forests, um, each one requiring a semi-manually made fire plan, call it an hour each, uh, that's sort of 100 hours uh, solid work. Um, and then of course, if anything changed, then you'd have to perhaps go and rework that. So I was like, well, that's not gonna work. Let's uh, take a database approach to this. Um, so by now we had, almost all the information in the database. Um, we used our uh, field teams to supplement that information and then build some post-just views 
uh, on top of that to drive a QGIS report um, for those areas. So uh, also we supply FINS uh, a cut of our data in the format that they require. Um, so using Model Builder kind of as a basic ETL tool to uh, provide them that and, and force it into the schema that uh, they need. Uh, those are the sort of post gist views. And that's the sort of example report. So using um, dynamic text, uh, reading that information from the uh, or the materialized views in, in the database. We also have a associated LizMap um, instance or map which has links to uh, live weather information from FINS as well. So Q field, uh, as I say, we are still rolling this out. One of the uh, key features we need is background tracking. So currently in Q field, if you lock the phone or um, task switch, GPS information stops being recorded. So um, they have a pledge currently to um, add that functionality which we are looking to uh, fund or potentially fully fund, just waiting to hear back from them, um, because that's a pretty key component of what we need QField to do. So QField solves the challenges of, challenges of working without cell phone data connection. Um, it, it is working currently through QField Cloud um, still got some questions in my mind, especially as it pertains to um, syncing large numbers of photos from the field, um, how robust that is and also how we store that and also the nature of synchronization. Um, I don't particularly want person B to download all of person A's photos, it's not relevant. Um, so yeah, some challenges there, but um, it is working and that allows us to integrate directly with PostGIS and have near real-time information. So in this case, uh, for our planting program, we um, send around quality checkers after the planting crews and they check the density, so they make some plots to make sure that you've got the required number of trees per hectare, as well as how well the tree has been planted. And um, so using QField as a, a form, and pushing those edits back to the database and allowing a, a near real-time view of the status of our planting as well. So, um, summary, I, I think that, I mean, it was an amazing opportunity to come into an org organization that was reasonably small um, and systems that needed updating and really taking a, a fresh look at them and being able to develop and implement that system. So with free and open source GIS, I really think you can you can start small. Um, because the investment is very low, that whole return on investment calculation is very easy. You don't have to necessarily uh, justify it as much. So it's easy to get over the, the line. Um, by doing that process about how you sort of generate a, an enterprise GIS as well, you, you really are discovering more about your data, not only how it is, but how it could be and what processes you could update to support that. Um, and in our case, the time spent in kind of developing that system and implementing that system is easily returned in time savings by you know, not having people coming to the GIS team requesting a basic map. We don't want to be doing that, we want to be using our brains to um, do analysis and really doing the value add, the things that we're, we're good at. Um, Chat GPT has saved my butt so much. <laughs> it is so good. Um, I mean, I, I know Python and I've, you know, I've touched JavaScript a bit, um, SQL obviously, but being able to just ask it a question, write me an SQL query that does this, this and this and this, boom, 90% it'll work, might need to change some things, but that has massively increased my productivity uh, and I guess kept my, <laughs> my limited brain space free for other things. Um, also, massive shout out to uh, Lynn's um, data service. Uh, again, being able to pull in those um, web services has been a massive um, boost or reduction in management overhead as well. So yeah, that's me. Probably a bit before time. Oh, 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Give the microphone.
in, in Anna's as well. Um, thanks, Tim. That was very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so you've been through a really interesting friction point from um, effectively a, a very small company as a startup. Um, and interestingly, you said now is the time to change. Mm. Um, so I'm really interested to know what triggered the decision to change and what are the things that the organization was thinking about sort of helped you reach that, but the biggest decision for the organization was um, how the organization and how you perceived the job beyond the sort of job itself. Mm. Yeah, so um, when I joined uh, New Zealand Carbon Farming, QGIS was already in use, um, so I guess it was a, a decision whether to continue on down that path versus um, go across to, say, Esri, but I guess to flip it around, yeah, it was, it was more of a question of why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we continue down the QJS, um, you know, post just for FOSS 4G stack? Um, and I couldn't really come up with any reasons why we wouldn't, apart from um, being able to find people that had knowledge training in QJS specifically. But um, we've had couple of people start fairly recently, one is familiar with QGIS, one has been using ArcGIS, and in my experience of using ArcGIS um, for all that time, the transition was pretty easy, um, you know, a few months solidly using it and you're, you're into it, so, yeah. All right, don't want to keep anyone from their free and open source on top of their software job. <laughs> I want to carry on this discussion because I encountered a few clients that they have been reluctant to get to the foster G stack because usually in China, especially smaller organization, you have one person or a couple of person that they really drive that maybe are expert on that, that they can build it. But if this person goes away, which can happen, then a lot of ventures, they feel like, oh God, I'm stuck with something I can't even touch. So mm -hmm. have you encountered that? Do you have solution for that or advice? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, uh, when, I, when I think back, you know, ag again, five years ago, that was especially a concern, you know. I, at least the impression was, as a sort of outsider looking in, that you really needed some, um, and, I, and I say this with respect, <laughs> geeky people, right, to, to implement uh, a FOS4G kind of solution. Um, I think that's really changed in the last five years. Again, we've got many companies we use at QGIS that will sell you a complete cloud-hosted solution, and we're looking to bring that in-house, which they'll do for us. Very cost-effective. It's like $1,100 a year, you know? That's like nothing in terms of licensing costs or... Um, but then also um, chat GPT. <laughs> like, honestly, <laughs> like, you can, you can just, you know, offload expertise so much to that. I mean, obviously, you still have to have an idea of the underlying principles and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but I think that has reduced that barrier in terms of the, the customization that you need to perhaps do a bit more on the possible G side. do some volunteering with a very large organization that was very worried about um, intellectual property in terms of um, information being uploaded to the cloud. Mm. So now, in your case, I'm not, I, I don't mean to, to uh, say whether or not your information is valuable or not, but I is that an issue that you had to think about, is about storing your information in the cloud? Uh, yes, it is. Um, well, essentially, we, so we use Microsoft Teams, um, and we don't have an internal IT department. We don't have uh, servers on-premise, so everything is in the cloud anyway. Um, but AccuGIS, GIS, for example, uh, has all the relevant, um, not qualifications, um, certificates and things in terms of how they um, 
do their cybersecurity and their backups and everything like that. So we're, we're pretty confident and, and happy with that solution. But in saying that, the mid-term plan is to actually bring that um, into our uh, into our own sort of hosting premise. Um, not only for security, not so much concern, but uh, just integration, I guess, with other parts of the business and being able to you know, traffic things a bit. Even the two fields aspect, you work. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the worry for us, is capturing disaster, humanitarian assistance, disaster recovery information can be very personal. Mm. Yeah, so as a company, we're not typically capturing no, 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 you're not. Lot, so, so that's yeah. not as much of a consideration. Um, no, no, I think um, we, yeah, we're we're happy with that, um, and you know the the solution that uh, we've come up with, I think, or bought, um, yeah, is more important to kind of have that data coming in than. Concerns about the risk of capturing them. So, um, hi. Um, just uh, one of the issues you're having with Q Field mm. in terms of the disparate base maps. Just to mm -hmm. say, like that's exactly one of my headaches at the moment. Yeah. And yep. uh, if, if if you're working on a solution, that would be really great. We're yeah. a smaller organisation, so. So I've, uh, I've written a script to uh, essentially do that. So the problem is Qfield, I think conceptually is more based on here's your small project area and here's your data. Um, and in terms of making a base map, which the Qfield plugin will do for you, it's more based on like, give me a base map for that area. In our case, we've got you know forest here, forest here, forest here, forest here, forest here. You can't make a base map for that whole extent. So uh, yeah, no, I've written a script, happy to share it with you, which, uh, you'll need to adapt it, but take a selection of forests, get the extents, export them to MB tiles, um, and package them up into one, um, which, again, it's still a problem because in terms of Qfield Cloud, there's no way to use a common uh, package. So if you've got five projects for five different people, there's no way to say, I don't want to have to upload this 800 megabyte um, raster package five times. Yeah. So there's some challenges there, but. Well, oh, thank you so much, Doug. That thank was you. really interesting. And this is from the team today. Sweet. Appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh.